uh, and welcome to the Monash Partners Comprehensive Cancer Consortium Tech Talk. My name is Tu and I'm a researcher at Monash University. Uh, I would like to begin by acknowledging the people of the Kulin Nations, who are the traditional owners of the land on which we gather today at the impeachable sea and across Victoria. I respectfully acknowledge their elders, past, present and emerging, and I pay my respects to any members of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community gathered among us this afternoon. Together with Professor Melissa Savi, Chair of Precision Medicine at Monash University and Chair of the MPCCC Executive, I would like to welcome you to today's MPCCC Tech Talk. Uh, these talks aim to engage the clinical and research communities to share expertise and knowledge about uh, state-of-the-art technological innovations in cancer medicine. We want these talks to be a platform for sharing information, for discussion. So please do get in touch if there are any topics you'd like to hear about. We really want to enhance research capabilities in our workforce, encourage uh, multidisciplinary interactions and establish a supportive community. And uh, today we're delighted to be joined by Dr. Nick Wong, who is going to talk to us about um, important things to consider when designing genomic assays, especially when doing things at very large scale. Uh, I think many people know Nick, but Nick is a bioinformatician who had initially trained in molecular biology. He obtained a PhD in 2006 from the University of Melbourne. During his PhD, he looked at um, the epigenetics of neurocentromeres. Nick continued on to study the extent of DNA methylation markers in a range of cancers before moving to an industry-based R&D role at Pacific Age in New Zealand, where he examined bladder cancer uh, biomarkers. Ever since being back from New Zealand, Nick has been generously offering his expertise in genomics technologies and bioinformatics as, as a member of the Monash Bioinformatics Platform and a senior research fellow at Monash University's Biomedicine Discovery Institute and the Australian Center for Blood Disease. Uh, before I hand over to Nick, I would like to go over a few points of housekeeping. So could all our attendees please ensure you have your video turned off and your microphone muted before we begin. Uh, I'll be taking questions at the end of Nick's presentation. To ask a question, uh, please click on participants at the bottom of your screen and select raise my hand. Uh, please remember to unmute and introduce yourself when asking your question and to lower your hand once you finish asking your question. Now, without further ado, uh, Nick, uh, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks for the kind introduction too. Um, and um, yeah, welcome everyone. It's nice to see some familiar names on Zoom. So uh, hello to you all. I suspect that there are more industry people here than there are academics, which is quite interesting, but that's fine. <laughs> okay, so let me share my screen. Now, I believe you can see my slides. Yes, we can. Yes, cool. All right. So let's get started. So yeah, uh, again, yeah, thanks for the opportunity uh, to, to give a talk here too, and, and Maeve. Um, uh, what I'm going to talk to you guys about today is um, uh, uh, the kind of issues that we've kind of come across, shall we say, uh, considerations that we've made um, in relation to uh, working up a genomic assay um, as part of the uh, ASPRI study. So um, for those of you who um, have not heard of um, ASPRI, um, just a couple of slides and to introduce. Um, so this is actually quite a large um, uh, prospective trial, which is randomized and double-blinded, um, where its aim is to look at um, low-dose aspirin as a means of primary prevention. Uh, and this is in a cohort or a population of um, healthy adults um, that uh, are, are that do not have cardiovascular disease, dementia, or disability at time of recruitment. Um, so um, the numbers are, are quite staggering. So there's over 19,000 participants that are actually in study, and around half of them were um, uh, exposed to low-dose aspirin um, uh, daily, uh, and the other half uh, to placebo. Um, it's been um, uh, the study is still quite um, active, um, as far as I know. 
uh, and the primary outcomes um, uh, have been achieved. And what was actually found was that um, there wasn't really any difference in at least the rate of um, cardiovascular disease uh, between uh, the two treatment arms. And if anything, um, if um, you're exposed to low dose aspirin uh, at a regular um, rate, um, you're at an increased risk of uh, bleeding which is not too surprising given uh, aspirin's actually a blood thinner. So of those uh, participants, um, over 12,000 um, had blood taken from them. And what's quite unique about the study is that a blood sample was taken at time of recruitment, um, and then the follow-up one was taken three years later. And this gives a lot of power uh, to, to this particular cohort in that we can actually do quite a lot of genomic studies, and there are uh, a number of them that are active. Um, certainly do transcriptomics um, on these um, samples, so to look at the RNA expression, um, and of course proteomics, so blood is quite a useful um, specimen to take from a person, um, and uh, there are certainly um, activities in that space, um, and the project that I'm a part of is actually looking at some inflammatory biomarkers in combination. <coughs> So what we're interested in um, is this idea of clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential. Um, it's quite a hot topic um, I've recently found. Um, a lot of people are starting to look at it as there are um, a lot of emerging implications as to uh, if you have this condition, uh, what that might um, pertain to in terms of risk. So the idea behind that is that in your uh, stem cell compartment, your hemopoietic stem cell compartment, um, uh, during the course of development and aging, uh, you can accumulate mutations in that compartment. Um, and they can be detectable um, via uh, you know, uh, very deep sequencing. Um, and if you have this condition, uh, and it's defined as um, uh, having an allele frequency of a mutation uh, at 2% detection, um, there is certainly um, association of increased risk of cardiovascular disease, certainly increased risk of hemopoietic malignancies, and I'll explain why in the next slide, um, and also um, has implications in the context of cancer in terms of uh, treatment and also, um, uh, uh, for instance, you know, bone marrow um, uh, transplants, for instance. <clears throat> So this is just another cartoon to kind of emphasize the point in, in terms of your um, stem cell compartment where you can accumulate uh, mutations and they uh, more often than not are benign. Um, uh, however, if you have uh, mutations uh, that affect um, uh, the set of genes here, uh, which are um, otherwise known to be associated with things like um, acute myeloid leukemia, and these mutations that actually change um, uh, the protein um, uh, itself, um, they can arise um, at a certain point of time. And that's when you've got uh, this um, condition called CHIP. And if that continues on, um, you, you will then develop um, you know, uh, MDS, and that could actually eventuate into full-blown full leukemia. So this is something that we're interested to look at um, in relation to the Asprey cohort. So we can actually ask some really interesting questions because we've got such a large number of participants for which there is blood available. Um, so we can certainly look at the prevalence of CHIP and confirm previous um, findings in an otherwise aging uh, healthy uh, cohort. Um, we can also look at um, uh, whether or not uh, the effect of aspirin uh, could actually affect this pre prevalence because we've got these two time points from the same participant. Um, uh, and that's what I've just mentioned here. Uh, and I should say in, in brackets recently found out quite excitingly that um, there will be another round of um, collection uh, that is going to happen um, in this cohort. And the other thing I should also say is that um, there's actually quite a high retention rate as well. So there's still uh, majority of participants are actually still active in study, which is pretty cool. So that actually uh, sums up to about, you know, over 24,000 samples for which we would like to do a next generation sequencing assay. Um, and this is our truly uh, high throughput. Um, so in actually thinking about, um, you know, developing a, a assay to look at this condition where we want to look at, you know, 2% allele frequencies, we actually want to go further down than that and be a bit more sensitive. Um, and um, uh, that's one of the criteria to kind of think about uh, when, we, when we chose the actual 
uh, platform that we're going to use. Um, so it had to be sensitive. Um, this is still a work in progress. Um, so what I would say now is that I'm not going to show you any data in terms of um, uh, the variants uh, that we've detected on this platform. Uh, we're still trying to work through methods uh, to ensure that we've got, um, you know, the true signals. Um, we're just going to go through just the process of getting there today. Um, so the second thing is to kind of um, consider that the actual process of, you know, preparing the library for sequencing is simple because we are dealing with over 20,000 samples here at one time. Um, the other thing is that it has to be cheap. And we were given, or I was given the brief that it had to be about $40 per sample. And that's what the data at hand. So that includes library preparation and sequencing. And if you do the sums, that's an over $800,000 experiment. Now, at the time when we actually wrote this grant, um, nothing really existed. Uh, and we really wanted to find that sweet spot. Um, and so um, there was kind of a lot of customization and thought and proof of concept um, uh, that was performed. Um, and uh, in that time, uh, oops, uh, RAMSEQ um, was, um, RAMSEQ came about. And so we had a bit of a play on that. Um, and we considered this because um, it, it, it met you know, at least two um, of the three things that you can see here. And what they are is the, in terms of simplicity, is that um, it is effectively a two um, PCR step uh, library preparation process, where the first um, uh, step is to use gene specific primers. So this panel was custom designed uh, to the genes that we we're interested in. And with conventional library preparation uh, and sequencing after this kind of step, you need to um, actually clean it up and remove, um, you know, excess primers before you go into the second stage, uh, which is the sample barcoding step. Now, there's a couple of shortcuts in this uh, technology in that we don't have to do that cleanup. We do a simple dilution um, of that PCR product, and then that goes straight into the second um, uh, indexing step, um, as shown here. Um, and once you have a finished library, uh, conventional ways is to actually clean that up again um, and then quantify that. Uh, and then based on that quantification, pull um, that uh, particular library with all the other libraries you wanna to put together. And the other shortcut to this technology is that we don't have to do that. Uh, we can just collapse all the libraries from a plate and do one cleanup and just quantify that pool and it's ready for sequencing. And the second thing to actually um, uh, achieve that kind of price point is to actually multiplex um, very high uh, and actually use uh, the economies of scale by uh, jumping onto a NovaSeq system. So a couple of details about the uh, custom pool design. Um, so it's currently in two pools, um, as you can see here. And they comprise of around 115 or 116 primer pairs. So each of those PCRs are amplifying um, that number of amplicons. Um, so the actual target size here is uh, just over 46 KB. Uh, and this is actually quite an important number to consider when you are um, designing a custom panel. Um, and uh, it's also related to well, how deep do you want to sequence, which is related to how sensitive you want the assay to be. And based on that, we've got 46 KB, and we want about 15,000 X coverage uh, at every position um, of that target region. That will give you some level of sensitivity in terms of what you can detect, um, and it's certainly below 1% in theory. Um, this is just a shopping list of genes that we um, considered and designed and targeted. Um, they are known uh, in previous studies to be certainly associated with CHIP and, and um, uh, acute myeloid leukemia. And the thing that I mentioned before was about sa sample barcoding and multiplexibility. Um, we are, um, we've got access to <clears throat> um, the ability to actually uh, sample index uh, 1536 at one time. Um, and these are also what's known as unique dual index barcodes. Um, and we're still in the process of actually testing them. Um, it's not an off-the-shelf product, it's uh, very R&D. And we've certainly detected certain anomalies in, in, in this kind of set, which we are going to rectify. Um, and as I mentioned before, um, to get that economies of scale in terms of sequencing or getting to a time to result um, is uh, using the NovaSeq S4 flow cell. 
So there's 1536 samples that we can barcode into the one tube. We can actually further kind of barcode um, the data or, or, or the samples by loading them in a specific lane. So there are actually four physical lanes that we can load independently um, on the S4 flow cell, which means we can actually plex up to 6,144 samples per run, which means that that's about four sequencing runs to complete the entire project. Um, and this all kind of rattles off the tongue really nicely and it sounds really cool, but um, you know, very early on, I was already thinking, well, where are the bottlenecks um, in this process? Um, and is automation um, um, you know, possible? And should we actually employ that? And the thing that makes me lose sleep at night is actually the logistics of this. So actually the tracking of the samples, which I'll talk a little bit um, about in the next couple of slides. So um, where are the bottlenecks? So this is just a very high level view um, of the process um, uh, in a couple of steps. So of course there's sample collection and DNA extraction. Thankfully for us, um, that was already completed and the DNA is sitting in the freezer. Uh, but there are also inherent you know, processes within library preparation to kind of think about uh, NGS sequencing and funnily enough the actual informatics and processing of the data is actually right at the very end and we have to actually address all these um, steps before that to actually get to that 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 part of things so in terms of bottlenecks it's really kind of thinking about how long would it take in terms of time to achieve a particular milestone or a particular step um, and as I mentioned, uh, sample collection, DNA extraction is actually, or sample collection at least, um, is, is the biggest bottleneck, uh, but that has been completed. Um, uh, uh, this study has been going on for near 15 years, I believe. Um, uh, and, and, you know, this part of it is, is fine. But there are certainly bottlenecks um, uh, downstream of that uh, that I'll uh, come, uh, you know, articulate to you pretty soon. <coughs> So if you go back to our number here of you know, 12,223 participants, um, as I mentioned, the DNA extractions were actually not performed by us. I'm actually glad of that. Uh, they were performed by the Garvin. Um, and uh, nice enough for them, they've actually nanodrop quantified them. So they, they, we have concentrations um, from each of these extractions. Um, and I should say that um, uh, you know, uh, when you do a, uh, a DNA extraction from just any blood sample, you do get variable concentrations there. And that's quite a, a key thing to kind of consider and think about. Um, they, uh, the, the DNA samples were stored in plates of 96 tubes. Um, and what I show you here, it's not a very nice image snapshot of them, but the baseline samples were actually stored uh, and arrayed in a particular brand. Um, of sample tubes. Um, I believe these were NUNC tubes. And the year three were actually in a different um, brand um, of storage. And I believe that's the Fluidex um, tubes there. The other thing as well, um, and it's through no fault of the study uh, itself, is that the, 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 the DNA samples are, um, I suppose, processed and stored uh, in, in the order in which they were collected. Uh, they weren't actually matched. Um, so there's no rhyme or reason um, of, of where they are sitting on the plate uh, and uh, definitely in the freezer. So we have a sample plate bottleneck. So we've got the DNA extracted. Um, uh, however, uh, the matching samples, the, the baseline and year three DNAs are actually in different parts um, of the biobank. So you, we actually do need to kind of try and uh, bring them together, uh, put them onto the same assay plate and to keep that, you know, as consistent as possible to reduce any chance of, you know, uh, library preparation batch effects. Um, and so the biobank's managed by James Fong, who's uh, really great to work with um, and is uh, actually um, in the process of um, picking these samples uh, in the freezer and actually matching them uh, together. Um, so we want the, the baseline year three in the same plate. Um, we also would like to have the, the DNA to be of the same amount. So we're actually assaying or looking at the same amount of DNA um, uh, from each sample, from each participant. 
um, and as I mentioned before, um, the, the concentrations of the uh, biobank DNAs are quite variable. Um, and ideally, what we want uh, to kind of really streamline this process as well is to create a plate for library preparation so that they have an equal volume. Uh, and that will allow um, uh, quite uh, easily uh, the addition of the primer and library prep uh, to the plate um, in a fixed volume. So you can start to see, you know, the parts of this which are, you know, automatable or where a robot can, um, can, can, can come and play. Um, so there are quite a wide range um, of uh, liquid handling robots that are available on the market. This is certainly not an exhaustive list. I've actually just shown you here some, uh, you know, uh, examples of robots that are available. Certainly aware that there are people from vendors or representatives from vendors listening in on this. Uh, apologies that I didn't put uh, your your robot on there, uh, but you can have effectively a general purpose robot, um, which is great. Um, it's infinitely customizable, which also means that an infinitely number of things can go wrong with it um, in terms of programming and things like that. Um, or you can have specialized um, uh, robots, you know, such as like the Kaya Symphony and the, and the, um, the, the Janus here. Uh, and these are robots that are specific to, you know, DNA extraction and maybe qPCR uh, setup. Uh, the Janus here is, you know, specific for actually library preparation, um, and and that's one thing they can do, and it's probably the only thing they can do. Um, and depending on, you know, the robot model, um, you know, you, you may have, you know, tracking and tracing, so basically a log and record of what the robot actually did. Uh, so you tell a robot or program a robot to do something to deliver uh, a certain uh, volume from one position to another, and that's actually tracked and traced and recorded. Um, and logged. Um, so you'll see the Fluent a little bit more later because we have access to one of these um, uh, over at Clayton uh, in what's known as Robocore or the antibody production facility. Um, and that's the thing that we've been using for um, a lot of our robotic work. So there are other bottlenecks. Um, so this is just a, quite an early map of uh, some numbers um, that uh, we thought about. Um, don't expect you to kind of absorb everything, but I'll just take you through this. Um, the initial kind of concept of, of actually uh, processing these samples or putting these samples um, into a plate uh, for this particular assay uh, required Picking. And I mentioned before, James is the one who's actually in the uh, biobank um, matching the baseline and year three samples from each participant and putting them onto the same plate. Um, he's estimated that it will take about three hours to um, complete a plate. Um, and in this case, a plate of, is 88 samples or 44 participants. Um, and if you do the sums, um, there's about 233 plates for the entire cohort. Um, and if it's three hours per plate, that will take 29 days at minimum, uh, assuming that James works seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Um, he doesn't. Um, it's a typical work day, which is an eight hour day. Um, and if he's doing that, he cannot do anything else. So this 29 day is, uh, minimum was actually multiplied out by three at minimum. Um, again, assuming that he works seven days. Um, in terms of the plate normalization, um, so what we're doing here is that we've now, you know, got the samples together on the one plate, they're all at different concentrations, we're getting the robot then to actually, um, uh, you know, normalize the concentration so that it will deliver um, the same volume um, of DNA into an assay plate. Um, I've got here N hours, it actually takes uh, about four hours um, uh, in the day uh, to do a plate. Um, and from there, um, it will go on to the thermocycling. Now, at the time that we um, uh, developed this, this was actually pre-COVID. Um, and I mentioned to you that we wanted, you know, everything as consistent as possible, right down to also the PCR machines being as consistent as possible. Uh, and where we we're based um, uh, at the Central Clinical School, we didn't have a array of the same model PCR machine uh, to actually do the library preparation. And we actually uh, struck up a deal with um, uh, the, the, the lovely people over at VCGS, MCRI, where they actually had um, eight um, of these uh, Verity machines uh, that sit on idle 
um, overnight. Um, and they graciously said it would be okay for us to jump on these um, overnight. And again, if you do the sums of that, um, uh, assuming again, seven days um, and every evening will come along and run um, the library prep, that will take at least three months to complete the entire project. So there's certainly a couple of bottlenecks here that could be addressed a bit better. Um, in terms of the process of uh, plate concentration normalization, this is just a, um, a, a workflow diagram that um, we mocked up uh, to hand to Haley um, over at RoboCore, just visually to kind of work out what the process entails. Um, and again, don't expect you to kind of read these um, little bits of text. Um, they're just basically crucial uh, points, um, effectively the requirements that we want uh, for the robot to do its thing. Um, and just to take you through it at a high level, I mentioned previously that um, the baseline tubes of which contained the DNA for the biobank were a different model to the um, follow-up or year three tubes. Um, and uh, what we decided to do is basically pick the uh, baseline and uh, year three um, sample from the same participant, but then place them onto the same position of those respective plates because they're slightly different, different brands um, and they have slightly different specifications. So they're on two plates um, and then the robot, uh, we tell the robot uh, what to do. We specify the um, actual concentration and also the uh, volumes um, required um, of both the DNA and the diluent. And then the robot will go happily go away and pick those samples and then place them into what we call an intermediate plate here. Um, and this is where the plate contains the baseline and year three sample on the same, on the same actual plate. Um, and we have now our concentration normalized DNA. Uh, so that's the, the, the first part of the process. Um, and of course, as a sanity check, we would actually uh, quantify uh, the DNA concentrations from that just to confirm that uh, the, the robot has actually diluted to the appropriate specification. And then that's divided into a second part, which is basically to take that intermediate plate and effectively print sample plates. So that's basically taking um, a set volume um, at a given concentration um, that we've set um, and literally uh, dispense into multiple plates. So we're printing replicate plates um, uh, for uh, this particular project. The initial um, uh, starting concept of it was to go 96 well, uh, but because of COVID, um, we couldn't really travel, um, you know, up and down between Paran and Parkville. Um, and uh, I believe Bansi is actually on <laughs> online, so a big shout out to her. Uh, we, we, we negotiated to purchase a um, 2 by 384 well PCR machine, so we have it actually in house. Um, and printing these samples now onto 384 well plates. So that's already kind of reduced that bottleneck uh, from, you know, four plates, four 96 well plates can all actually be thermocycled um, in the one 384 well. And because the heat box actually got two of them, um, that has completely eliminated that bottleneck, which is great. So, um, you know, working up this process, uh, a lot of the, um, the stakeholders, shall I say, within the project, it was a journey to um, uh, to get them up to speed with, you know, what what robots can really do and what they can't. Um, and uh, there was a lot of testing that was that was performed by Haley and her team at RoboCore just to ensure that what they've programmed uh, into the robot is actually what the robot is doing. Uh, so it's really nice to see um, a, a picture like this. Um, to me, it's, it's quite calming uh, because uh, we can see that uh, from a 96 well plate delivered into 384, you can see that it's actually done its thing with a regular array of colored liquids. This is actually food dye. Um, so they're actually using food dyes to actually show this. Um, so it's doing its thing in terms of printing. Um, and this is just a, a snapshot of a, of a test plate to kind of show that the robot is diluting the way uh, they have told the robot to dilute with, uh, you know, a set um, uh, concentration of this food dye and then mixing it together. So you can see these kind of, um, you know, more paler blue um, wells to just show that, yes, it is diluting because 
the DNA that we're actually dealing with from the biobank is a colorless liquid, so we wouldn't know otherwise. Um, the other thing as well um, is uh, that, you know, you, you tell a robot to do something um, and then you test it, you can't change the program. You can't change the specification of what you want the robot to do without testing it again. So there was a lot of program development and testing and optimization that happened uh, in the background before we actually went ahead and started to use these samples because we certainly appreciate these are very precious samples and we didn't want to lose them. And as you can see in this video, I hope um, it kind of presents through, um, this is part of the testing process, but you do certainly see the robot actually picking up one of these sample tubes and it went straight off screen and straight into the bin. And that's something we don't want to happen. Um, and it only happened with a particular brand um, of um, the tubes that we were using, uh, which was a little bit annoying, uh, but it was great that we actually caught that um, and we certainly changed uh, uh, the specification of how the robot was actually delivering the volume here. So just to explain, this is a, a 10 microliter uh, pipette tip um, and it's quite short um, and what the, the actual head of it actually kind of fit quite nicely to the tube. Uh, so what we did was actually change that and uh, that particular step and not use the, the 10 microliter pipette tip but use a, a higher volume pipette tip. Um, the other thing as well is uh, there is a volume variation in robots. So, you know, there is this misconception that they're perfect, uh, but they're actually perfect uh, within a certain specification. So if you tell it to um, suck up uh, one microliter, uh, for instance, there is actually a plus or minus 10% variation of that one microliter volume. At least it is consistent usually on every day. Um, so, I mean, this kind of error range is also in your pipettes. Uh, but if you have an RA do this and do this over 20,000 times, um, the, you know, uh, humans are more prone to error. Uh, cool. So uh, the other thing to talk about is actually logistics and um, of uh, uh, encoding uh, the sample. Uh, so um, I'll move on to that in the next slide here. Um, so in terms of... Um, uh, tagging uh, a DNA sample with a particular identifier. Um, all the DNAs that are sitting in the biobank um, are actually in um, these vials which have uh, barcodes on each of the vials. Um, and so you can certainly have uh, a 2D or 1D barcode. And what I'm showing you here is a 2D barcode um, and it's also human readable. And what I mean by that is that you have options uh, to have only the machine readable barcode, which is this array of squares, um, and only a machine can read it, meaning you have to scan it uh, to actually decode what that is. Um, uh, but uh, you pay a little bit more money, you also have the human readable part of that barcode so that an operator or a research assistant can actually look and confirm that yes, that is indeed the barcode and the sample you're dealing with. So that's great for the bio-banked uh, um, samples. Uh, when they move on to PCR plates, um, so you can't actually, um, you know, barcode each well of a PCR plate. Uh, so there are different ways of actually ensuring you're working with the right plate and therefore the right samples. Um, so you can certainly uh, use the positional encoding. Uh, so the position on that plate uh, encodes what that sample is. Um, and of course, um, we're using barcoded um, uh, PCR plates as well as we go along. There's another way also to encode um, information is to use, um, you know, different colored plates. Oops, sorry, excuse me. Different colored plates as you work through your workflow. So you can imagine uh, with PCR round one, you'll use a clear uh, PCR plate. So you know that you're, you're, you're doing uh, round one PCR and that's a round one PCR product after it's been thermocycled. And then you transfer that into a different colored plate, which is, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, code to say that it's actually the second part of the library preparation process. This has uh, its um, challenges and it can be prone to error because what I'm showing you here is um, uh, the photo of the clear plate in the previous slide, but I've rotated it and hidden the, um, uh, the well identifiers. Um, so the only way to, to, to actually ensure that you've got the right orientation is this notch um, 
that I think I've highlighted here. Yep. Um, so this notch would, would, would show orientation, but um, uh, some of the robots that uh, you work with, and certainly with the Fluent that we have, uh, doesn't, doesn't actually have a physical notch to ensure that you, you're locking that uh, plate into place. Um, so, you know, there are other ways to actually ensure that you've You've, you've got that going because uh, if you start dealing with uh, so many plates and go into this rhythm um, of repetitive um, uh, action, um, it's just so easy to just inadvertently uh, load a plate in the wrong orientation. So the current wave flow as it stands, um, we, again, we've mapped this out uh, in terms of how long it will take uh, to actually process all the samples in the ASPE project. Um, we estimate that it will take um, to process 352 participants for which we've got the baseline and follow-up DNA samples. Um, it will take one day uh, to plate normalize and, and be put onto a, a PCR plate. This was quite um, a laborious process uh, to get to this stage. Um, so we're certainly printing plates uh, for the project proper but we're also um, printing extra plates uh, that we could potentially use to come back and validate, but also uh, for um, access to other research projects uh, that might want to use this uh, DNA. And so we print two uh, plates for our, um, our project, and we've got four additional plates here um, that uh, go into the biobank uh, for storage and future unspecified use. Um, so it's one day to print those uh, plates. It's another day to actually process those plates through library preparation. Uh, and we've got Anna Leiter who's recently joined us um, as a very, very good RA uh, to do that. Um, uh, and uh, it's then cleaned up uh, in the one Eckendorf tube. Um, and then that is uh, um, held uh, or paused until we rack up the 6,100 samples that can then all go onto the sequencer. And we are very fortunate to have a NovaSeq um, sitting at the Alfred Hospital uh, that is um, uh, very well operated by Helen Mitchell, uh, who oversees uh, the sequences there. Um, and so we work closely with her um, as we uh, do this. So in total, um, there are um, you know, 233 384 well plates. Um, and you know you don't want to stare at them long enough just to try and recognize them. So there are actually other things that we um, have incorporated into our process to really ensure that we're tracking um, uh, these samples properly. Um, so uh, in addition to the primer set for our gene specific um, assays, um, IDT as part of this um, uh, platform have also got what's known as a sample ID set. Uh, which is a set of amplicons that interrogates 72 SNPs and um, uh, an array of sex chromosome assays. Um, and so we can actually use then the data that we actually generate to actually track the samples. Um, so the theory is, is that we've got baseline in year three from matching participants. They will have identical genotypes when we go and interrogate and have a look at those. Um, and there's also this idea of pattern ID and physical ID of the plate. Um, so what you can see here is just a cartoon of a 96 well plate and I've just colored in like well H12 um, as being blank. Um, that's quite easy to actually see in addition to the barcoding around the plate to actually ensure orientation as well as the notch. So that is certainly one way to actually physically ID uh, the plate. Um, and also we've got the position ID, as I mentioned before, but we can actually then look at the um, actual patterns. So in this case, the genotype patterns, um, uh, in this case, I've actually colored in the, the DNA concentrations um, of, of the plate proper. So that, that's a, a unique barcode in and of itself uh, that could be used to ensure that we are tracking the samples properly. So as a proof of principle, um, so I should say that we, pro we are the first um, like genomics heavy uh, project that required the services of RoboCore. Uh, we uh, did the simple, um, uh, wouldn't call it an experiment, but process to actually 
quantify the samples using qubits. I mentioned before that the Garvin uh, uh, quantified these by nanotrop. Uh, we wanted it to be a bit more refined measurement using qubits. Um, and we had recently completed over 19,000 samples uh, quantified by the Robocore and the process. And this is kind of what you see um, here. Um, so <clears throat> each of these colors, so each of these dots are, are a particular sample measured by a nanodrop up at the Garvin on the y-axis and qubit uh, on the x-axis. Um, and they're color coded by basically a processing batch. Uh, so we did over 20 processing batches um, and they by and large sits on, you know, are, are quite concordant with one another with the exception of this kind of cloud of samples where the Garvin nanodrop um, was much higher to what we were measuring, which is close to zero. Um, and there was a lot of uh, back and forth in terms of are we, um, uh, is the robot, you know, doing what we think it's doing, uh, what's going on. Um, and so we were uh, ensuring that that process was correct. And I should say that these um, samples were actually the initial samples as we were working through uh, this process. Uh, and what we found out um, uh, later on uh, was actually a systematic um, uh, difference uh, between uh, the extractions that were performed um, uh, by the Garvin. Uh, effectively, um, we were measuring different plates um, and therefore the, the um, concentrations did not marry up. So um, uh, currently the work is actually looking at uh, what we're calling the pilot project. Uh, so um, over two and a half thousand um, participants within Asprey have already been sequenced and this has recently been published um, uh, by whole genome sequencing. Um, and from that study, uh, we were able to identify um, uh, 44 participants that uh, actually uh, have this condition of CHIP. Um, and 44 that did not by whole genome sequencing. And we've actually selected those um, and actually ran them through uh, our custom RAMC assay. Um, still a very much work in progress and happy to come back and talk about that uh, in another tech talk um, sometime in the future. So this is giving us like a truth sample set. Uh, what I'll actually talk about uh, quickly before I finish up um, is basically looking at the uh, sample ID um, uh, spike and uh, to actually identify uh, those samples, because uh, that to me was actually quite important. Um, I've still yet to figure out a way to kind of present this um, uh, better, but basically these bar charts, each of these are representing a particular participant. And the question is, uh, do the genotypes between the two samples match? And it's effectively true or false. And you can see here, by and large, with the exception of these ones, which I think are sample failures, uh, we've got two. Uh, particular participants where we think they're from the same participant in um, uh, year three baseline, but by the genotype data, um, they are different. Uh, so we've got half of them that are actually not concordant. Um, and this is actually not bad considering we have James at the biobank actually picking these manually uh, and checking that. Um, and uh, we have actually assessed here uh, just under 200 uh, participants worth of data. So this is a 1% error rate um, and it's actually quite good. Um, this will actually pick up systematic errors. So again, a plate rotation um, uh, if we get like a, a large number of samples um, that have been mixed up. The other cool thing as well is that I mentioned before that there are other genomic studies that are done on the same participants and therefore the same samples. Um, and we can use this genotype data that we're collecting with our assay to see if they actually match the other genomic um, studies. So we can then say with the data um, that we can match to the identifier in the you know, Uber database within ASPRI um, that we can actually match you know, between the, between the genomic studies um, and actually potentially repurpose some of this data um, uh, for other things. So yes, the samples match because uh, we didn't actually see uh, from the ones we studied um, uh, much significant differences there. Um, it's been, you know, a great journey and we're still going uh, forward. Um, one of the things is I hope you can appreciate, we're starting to amass a huge amount of data um, and one of the kind of roles that, you know, I, I was actually recruited into the project is to actually do the bioinformatics. Um, I haven't really shown you that much today, 
uh, except maybe this, which is uh, an interactive dashboard to try and get all the stakeholders in and, and actually appreciate some of the data. And what I'm plotting here is just some of the sequencing metrics that we're getting uh, so far, just to see, uh, just to get them to kind of understand. Uh, it's quite a complicated thing in terms of um, what do we consider as being a sample that has passed or failed uh, and, 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 and what do we consider um, as being a chip variant. So just as a kind of number to highlight here, um, this is uh, I think 88 participants worth, yes, uh, sorry, 44 participants worth, we've got you know over 50,000 variants to consider. This is just raw variants. And so that has to go through some filtering process and some logic um, before we can actually say that that variant is true. So it's very much a work in progress. Um, and that just is summarized here in terms of the challenges and the next part um, of the study, variant calling. Um, and I did notice that there will be another tech talk by Bernie Pope, um, who's uh, talking about variant calling. So I really look forward to that. Uh, but what I mentioned before is that, um, you know, this is our study here, the Asprey chip. We're collecting, you know, genomic data or, or, or sequencing data here, which we can actually I uh, hope I've shown, uh, been able to kind of match at least to um, some other genomic studies just based on gen genotype. So in summary, um, just to say that automation is handy, but um, you know, really do know its limits. Um, and uh, currently the cost of sequencing with the custom panel um, is actually below $40, $40 a sample. Um, I've got this number here in terms of what the uh, NovaSeq flow cell cost. Um, this is uh, dated now because I believe this price has actually dropped recently quite significantly, which is, you know, bodes well for us. Um, we can, in theory, multiplex over 6,000 samples per flow cell. Um, and, you know, we're actually, uh, as of this morning, just, just talking about that, whether we um, actually um, leverage uh, that, that drop in uh, sequencing reagent price and get more sequencing depth. Uh, from these samples. Uh, that's probably going to be likely to be the case. Um, so all behind all this um, is actually quite a number of procedures um, and um, algorithms in place to actually track the samples and try and link them back to the database. And we've just shown that we can actually do that, uh, which is actually quite pleasing to see. Uh, so that's it, and it leads me to thank um, quite a lot of people um, who are involved. So Zoe McQuilton is the CIA on this CHIP sub-study that I'm a part of. Um, you know, Hayley and her team of robot whisperers over at uh, the antibody production facility, RoboCore, um, and IDT, and of course, uh, Helen there. So I'll finish off with just the final acknowledgement side, which is really the team that I'm a part of, which is actually the bioinformatics platform as well. So thanks for your attention. You know, really happy to kind of take questions or discuss. Thank you very much, Nick. That's very impressive. Uh, $40 per sample. <laughs> very, very impressed. Um, do we have any questions? Nick. Hi, Gisela, how are you? Excellent talk. I'm, I'm quite impressed <laughs> with the amount of detail. I didn't, okay, this is going to sound very badly, but I didn't expect this from you just because you are a bioinformatician or I see you as a bioinformatician. <laughs> so one of my questions is, um, look, I never deal with 20,000 samples. Um, I deal with maybe 24, 96. And, and the type of samples I deal with are cancer related, so very complex and FPE and all this stuff. So generally what I get from the bioinformatician is do whatever you can in the lab and I'll deal with analysis. Whereas what you are saying here is in the lab you have to be super careful because anything you do in the lab then is going to impact on the analysis. So just wanted to understand a little bit. Oh yeah, absolutely. So, so yeah, um, yeah. The, the, can't stress the importance before you even get the data. You know, there's so many things that are done um, of the sample uh, that you lose providence of that sample, then it's game over. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm noticing some of the kind of technology platforms. You know, like I think uh, you know, TSO 500. Uh, the, the the new kind of Uber kind of cancer panel. There are inherent um, metrics in there to try and work out if you've got sample mix-ups. Um, and, and that's really, really key. Um, and it's a completely different project than I'm a part of, but um, you know, the, 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 the hand labeling of a tube 
uh, is, is it's so easy to mix up. I mean, the, I, you know, the, the, the example is, you know, a six or a nine, right? Um, uh, and, and all you need is a drop of ethanol and, you know, part of the clean, cleanup process is ethanol involved. Uh, yeah, if you lose, yeah, if you lose that identifier, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's really important. So I suppose my, my question was more towards rather than sample identification that obviously and whatever you can do to the play to make sure there's no mix up, that's absolutely yeah, sure and, and relevant. Yeah. Is uh, more about things, I don't know, like sample um, QC and, you know, if some sample fails, how does this impact with the results? If some samples you would have to give more PCR cycles, how does this impact the results? And I suppose my question is, do you think this is because you are trying to detect such a low allele frequency? Yeah, so we we're very ambitious to, to try and go down to 0.1% VAF. Um, and you might've noticed that RAMPSEQ does not have UMI technology. Um, and with a lot of the UMI um, kind of uh, processes, there's a lot of ligation steps and cleaning. Um, and it, it may well be automated, but one thing that I forgot to actually say here is that there is something called a dead volume. Uh, so there, there is like reagent, you know, uh, wastage, shall we say, or stuff that does that that that, that has to be there because the, the the physical specs of the robot. Um, but uh, yeah, in terms of sample QC and things like that, we are very fortunate that this is actually from blood um, rather than from a very challenging sample. Uh, we're still thinking of the uh, metrics and things as to what is considered a failed sample or something that's low confidence. Um, that's still very much a work in progress. Um, what's really interesting is that I think the whole field's moved to UMI kind of counting. Uh, one of the things that people may or may not appreciate that, okay, you can have UMIs, but you actually have to sequence a lot more to count the UMIs, right? <laughs> um, uh, and so, you know, the initial brief was, was, was that kind of price point. So UMIs were a little bit out of the question. Is, do we have any more questions for, for Nick? Um, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. Oh, hi, it's Vicky here. Um, just wanted to say well done, Nick. That's an amazing, amazing amount of work. Um, and I, yeah, I get your um, your comments about the, the Yumi's, for example. Yeah, and it's a lot of extra work to, um, they'd be fantastic. It's a lot of extra work to do them. Um, yeah, I think that that's all I wanted to say. Um, I've used those 2D barcode tubes before and, and they're, they're great. Um, and I was just wondering, I did unfortunately come in a, a little bit late. Um, uh, because you, you're transferring, so the, the 2D barcode tubes are individually, you can pull them out individually. Um, and you were saying you have to like reorder them. So had you considered reordering based reordering the master plate because you can move 2D tubes around and then taking from that, or is that going to introduce? Well, Sorry, no, that, that, that was exactly, um, that was exactly what was done. So the master plate oh, okay. has been reordered and, and oh. I don't know how James, the, the biobank manager does it, but he is tracking that. Oh, okay. um, so, so at the end of like, I suppose, um, picking the entire plate, you can actually scan it. Right. And there's software to kind of do that. Now, I mean, for those who might know the fluent, that there is actually a, a space where you can actually load many, you know, up to 100 plates uh, on the side carousel there. Uh, so in theory, the initial kind of concept was actually to do that. But sadly, that uh, that space is actually not refrigerated. Um, and so uh, there was concern that there would be degradation of the DNA, especially if it was oh. sitting at room temp for a long time. Yeah. So the theory was is that you could actually tell the robot where all these DNA samples are, yeah. you know, just, scan the barcode, and then just yeah. let it pick. Yeah. Um, but it takes time, especially if you're picking okay. one at a time. Yeah, OK. Yeah. Yeah. OK, great, thanks. No worries. Yeah, hi Nick. It's Mark Waltham here um, from hey, hey. How are you doing? Um, yeah, I enjoyed your talk. Um, obviously, what you're doing and the issues you face with looking at very low allele frequency is similar to the liquid biopsy area, where you're trying to look at below one percent. 
And something that you know I've thought about, maybe you have a comment on it. Um, when you have your the, the SNPs that you're looking at for this sample mix up, whether the purity of the call at the SNP might be useful as an indice of whether there's any within run cross contamination. So for example, if it's a highly polymorphic SNP, yeah. um, if there was a, a, a minuscule of cross contamination, you might expect the call not to be, you know, 50% G, but a, a little, you know, some other nucleotide down there at that point. Yeah. I'm not aware of any sort of bioinformatic tool um, where you can do that, but um, yeah, it, it, there's other issues out there. But I was just wondering if you're looking at the purity of these SNPs, if they are highly polymorphic and whether that's an indication that there might be something sneaking in mm. you know, with the same sample index. Yeah, look, that, that's a really great point. Um, and um, it's, it's the combination of the SNPs, right? So um, in terms of the actual allele frequency, that wasn't taken into account um, here. Um, it, uh, I basically took the genotype calls, which was either, you know, homozyga AA, yeah. you know, AT or TT. Yeah. Um, uh, and if that was the call, um, then you, you actually, you, you're blind to the kind of clonality aspect of it if you have oh, sample yeah. mix up. Yeah. Um, but I, I, that, that, that is a great point, which I hadn't actually thought about because, you know, it, it's, it, this is kind of like, you know, germline space. Yeah. Like, 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 well, at least the, 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 snip, the snip part of this was, was a germline kind of concept. But, and, and, and yet the chip is actually somatic effectively isn't yeah, it yeah. and so um no it's a good point <laughs> yeah okay. i'd like to talk to you more about that later yeah 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 sure i i'd just like to say uh, on behalf of the hematology side of the team it's really been great to work with nick and everyone involved zoe mcwilton who's the least elite investigator uh, uh who's a hematologist uh, is not able to be here today, but uh, on her behalf, just really want to thank Nick, not just for a great talk, but Nick and the team for all this fantastic <laughs> work. It's really appreciated and, and been very, very interesting and a steep learning curve for all of us. So <laughs> thanks so much, uh, Nick, for a great oh, talk. Thanks, Erica. Thanks for those words. I mean a lot. Thanks. We have time for one more question, Fleur. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, I just wondered whether you'd be prepared to go into some of the detail about your um, problems with your indexing that you mentioned, you just briefly mentioned that you had some issues with your um, ah, yeah. and, and what, how, how are you testing them? Um, so, you know, every time you test these indices, you have to actually sequence them. So that yeah. comes at a cost and we yeah. never really budgeted for kind of development costs. Yeah. Uh, the issues with the IDT indices, I think, uh, stem from production. So we had, um, you know, effectively barcode clashing. So, um, you know, a particular sample was expected to have, you know, a particular barcode combination of the, you know, the index one and index two. Uh, but what we actually saw was that it was swapped around. So half of index one. So, so it's like the index one was, um, you know, it's, they were effectively swapped. Um, and and I, I, we can trace that back to a manufacturing issue because uh, behind all of this, we're getting IDT to actually custom uh, create these um, indices pre-mixed. Right. Yeah. And, and it's the actual pre-mixed process that, that, that was an issue. Yeah, so it's not about sequ the inherent sequence of them that's causing an issue. No, um, we actually also, well, uh, are there Illumina people on here? Okay. <laughs> um, so, so, so the UDIs are actually 10 bases in length. Um, and so we've got 20 bases to do the uh, to do the sample, you know, demultiplexing. And for sadly, the the BCL convert um, software only allows up to two mismatches. We can actually go further than that, but it's uh, sadly hard coded that we can't go past two mismatches. So I mean, this is just to kind of relax because there are you know inherent sequencing errors um, that 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 come into play. Uh, but we could, you know, wear more mismatches from the sample indexes, but we can't, you know, we've, we've lost that power, even though we've got 10 base, um, uh, 10 base sample indexing. Yeah. yeah. All right. I had more questions, but we have to have you back, Nick. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for your for your presentation and thank you everyone for attending. I hope you've enjoyed the, the discussion.
Uh, there'll be one more MP2C talk this year. In November, we'll welcome uh, Bernie Pope, who will talk to us about somatic VRN calling and whole genome sequencing. Uh, you can sign up to the MPCCC newsletter or follow MPCCC on social media uh, to find out more about uh, our events. Again, thank you, everyone, and uh, have, a, have a good afternoon. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, too. Cheers. See you later. See ya. Thank you all.